This lesson is about critically appraising knowledge in the journal articles for clinical practice improvement. Few practitioners can keep up with all the research being published. With current competing priorities in healthcare settings, it's challenging to determine which studies are best for a busy nurse to use for clinical decision-making and quality improvement. Usefulness of studies in the literature is difficult to discern. This week, you'll be provided with the skill set to critically evaluate research findings in journal articles and determine if the evidence can be used in clinical practice to make improvements. This might be one of the most important skills you learn in this course. So what is an evidence-based intervention? Interventions have proven efficacy and effectiveness within randomized control trials and improve health behaviors, health outcomes, or health-related environments. Interventions can include either programs, practices, policies, or guidelines. So there's three overarching questions when you critically appraise evidence. Are the results of the study valid, which is the validity? What are the results, which are reliability? And will the results help me in care for my patients, which is applicability? Nurses have made major inroads in identifying and understanding and developing an array of knowledge sources that inform clinical decisions and actions. The process for generating practice-based evidence has become rigorous and high quality evidence needs to be included into cl clinical decision-making and thus quality improvement projects. The goal of evidence-based practice is to use the highest quality of knowledge in providing care to produce the greatest positive impact on patients health status, and health outcomes. This entails using the following for patient care. Valid research evidence as the basis for clinical decisions and quality improvement. Clinical expertise to combine research with practice-based evidence to tailor clinical actions for the individual patient situations or settings. And patient choice and concern for the acceptability of evidence-based care at the individual patient level. Clinicians must consider the level of evidence when evaluating research findings in the literature. Critical appraisal is the hallmark of evidence-based practice. It's a core skill for an advanced practice nurse, which is anyone with a graduate degree. The main types of evidence are quantitative or qualitative research, clinical judgment, and knowledge about patient concerns, choices, and value. There are rating systems for the strength of evidence, and advanced practice nurses need to understand how to examine the strength of the evidence in the literature. There are three elements, quality, quantity, and consistency. Quality is the extent to which a study design, the way it's conducted and analyzed, minimizes selection, measurement, and confounding biases. This is called internal validity. And then quantity, the number of studies that have evaluated the question, the overall sample size across the studies, and the magnitude of treatment effect and strength of causality. This is called the relative risk or odds ratio. And then consistency, whether the investigators doing the study that was published in the journal were both similar and different study designs to report similar findings. In other words, is it apples and oranges or oranges and apples or apples and apples? So usually we use a hierarchy of evidence. There's several taxonomies that have been developed to examine the strength of evidence. And here's one. The highest is level one, systematic review or meta-analysis of RCTs. The next would be level two, one well-designed RCT. Level three is a well-designed controlled trial. Four is systematic reviews of descriptive or qualitative studies, not of RCTs. Level five is multiple descriptive or qualitative studies, and six is a single descriptive or qualitative study. The lowest level of evidence are seven opinions and or reports of expert committees. 
Many healthcare systems have adopted a rating tool. Find out what your employer recommends. Here's a picture of this seven part hierarchy of evidence that we just presented on the last slide. So evidence is a collection of facts that grounds one belief that something is true. There are systems of quality indicators that provide tracking over time of evidence. Here's three. Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, National Quality Forum, and National Database of Nursing Quality Indicators. Specific skills for appraising the main types of evidence and knowledge to guide clinical practice are prescribed for the following. There's evidence from quantitative research, evidence from qualitative research, and then knowledge about patient concerns, choices, and values. So here's how to critically appraise quantitative evidence. It's exasperating if a literature search to answer a clinical question reviews multiple study findings that do not agree, and if an intervention study found no more effectiveness than the placebo. When appraising quantitative research, reliability and validity must be taken into consideration. All studies have some flaws, but the process of critical appraisal should assist an advanced practice nurse in deciding whether a study is flawed to the point that it should be discounted as a source of evidence. Both clinical significance, or the impact of the findings clinically, and statistical significance, results were not found by chance, should be considered. Are the study results valid? Whether the results were obtained by a sound scientific method? Is there bias, anything that distorts the founding? And were there confounded results? Are the study results reliable? Do the numbers add up? What's the magnitude of effect of the improvement? Is it 10%, 20%? And then what's the strength of association? What were the measures of clinical significance? And was there precision in measurement? Why was the study done? What was the sample size? How were the data analyzed? And what does the research mean for clinical practice? So here's an example of how to critically appraise quantitative evidence. Case studies are lower in the hierarchy of evidence as they lack objectivity. They describe the history of single patients to inform a story and report on nursing experience and can be used as an adjunct to infer other information. Whereas case control studies investigate why certain people develop a specific illness, have an adverse event with a particular treatment or behave a particular way, trying to find facts that explain by looking back. Ask how cases were obtained, were controls appropriate, is the estimate of the effect given? Is there bias? Are comparisons made to other studies? And will it help my patients? In cohort studies, we investigate courses of disease or unintended consequences of treatment. A cohort is a group of similar patients who are followed over time. What you need to ask is, was the sample representative, was follow-up long, were outcome criteria objective, what is the magnitude of the relationship and are patients similar to my own? And will the results help my patients? And then most of you are familiar with RCTs, which are randomized control trials. They examine the effectiveness of the intervention. What you need to ask is, was there random assignment? Was it blinded? Did attrition occur? In other words, people dropping out. Was the control group appropriate for comparison? Was the measurement tool valid and reliable? And how large was the intervention? Were all important outcomes measured? And was the treatment feasible? And is the treatment feasible for my clinical setting? There are also reviews. A systematic review is a compilation of similar studies through a comprehensive search that summarizes, appraises, and communicates the results of multiple studies where a meta-analysis is a statistical synthesis of findings in similar studies. Integrative reviews are a systematic review without summary statistics, and narrative reviews summarize authors' opinions on a specific issue. 
What you need to ask in regard to these types of published papers are the, are, are the studies contained in the review RCTs? Does the review include detailed search strategy? Is validity of the individual studies described? Were results across studies consistent? How large was the intervention? Are patients similar? And is it feasible to implement in my study? And here's how to critically appraise qualitative evidence. This is the science and art coming together in the design and execution of qualitative studies. What you look at here is trust, trustworthiness criteria, credibility, dependability, transferability, and conformability. And then also authenticity criteria, fairness, ontologically, catalytic, tactical, and education. Ask the following questions of qualitative re research studies in publications. How were the participants chosen? Was accuracy and completeness of the data assured? How believable were the results? Does the research approach fit the purpose of the study? Are data analysis techniques appropriate? What is the study's contribution? Are the researchers' role and activities explained? What are the reported results? And are the results useful? So the final steps in critical appraisal is evaluation and synthesis. Once studies have been defined as keepers, they should be synthesized. Use of evaluation tables with categories are helpful when comparing studies, making decisions about which study details and findings need to be synthesized. The clinical question drives the decision making. Cluster studies around different aspects of methods of findings, design, and intervention. Conduct thoughtful consideration of inconsistencies and consistencies, and pull together conclusions after examining limitations. Then you should formulate what should be done with the knowledge to improve patient care and health outcomes. And think critically about clinical trials. Do they include women or low income? Was there conflict of interest with investigators or was there bias in dissemination of good findings? Elements of good clinical judgment include experiential learning, ongoing self-improvement, use of clinical forethought, seeing the unexpected, and anticipating risks, particularly within the context of patient choice and concerns in clinical judgment. The Institute of Medicine application of the principles and methods of evidence-based practice include integration of the best research in evidence, best clinical experience that is consistent with clients and patients' values. So understanding the adoption of innovation has a trajectory. There's innovators, then early adopters, then it tips over to a majority of adopting an intervention, and finally, traditionalist. Common errors when deciding about intervention effectiveness include reliance solely on individual antidotes and remembered cases. That child made an amazing change during treatment. Confusing satisfaction with clinical improvement. The family just loved coming to therapy, never missed a session during their three years. Amazing, too bad they had to move away. Misattribution of the cause of change or failure to appreciate resilience and natural recovery. The family got multiple services and wraparound care. With treatment, her PTSD resolved in about three months after the rape. And the guru effect in training and treatment adoption. I heard Mr. McDreamy's doing a level two training and it's in San Diego in January. Those videos were just so amazing. I have got to try that. So what to look for in a practice? Treatment or intervention protocol that has at least some scientific research evidence for its efficacy with its intended target, problem, and population. Evidence may be based on a variety of research designs, RCTs, controlled studies without randomization, 
open trials, pre, post, or uncontrolled studies, or multiple baseline single case design. The degree to which we are persuaded that the treatment or intervention is effective will vary by the quality of the empirical support for the way the study was conducted. You need to look at the number of RCTs, replication of research by others, and the sampling size, comparison treatment, and effect size. Various methods have been developed for classifying evidence that should be enjoyed by treatment approaches. So the gold standard for evidence is a randomized control trial. Participants are randomly assigned to either an intervention or control group. This allows the effect of the intervention to be studied in groups of people who are the same, except for the intervention. Any differences seen in the groups at the end can be attributed to the difference in the treatment or intervention alone and not on bias or chance. Also, it's important that peer review be included in published articles. Peer review is a process used to check the quality and importance of research studies. It aims to provide a wider check on the quality interpretation of a study by having other experts in the field review the research and conclusions prior to publication. So it's important to only utilize peer reviewed journal articles as evidence. In addition, efficacy and effectiveness. Efficacy focus on, focuses on whether an intervention works under ideal circumstances and looks at whether the intervention has any impact at all. Where effectiveness focuses on whether a treatment or intervention works when used in the real world. An effectiveness trial is done after the intervention has been shown to have positive efficacy in an efficacy trial. So as you know, there are scientific rating scales. If multiple outcome studies have been conducted, the overall weight of evidence suggests that an intervention has a negative effect upon a client served, or there is a reasonable theoretical, clinical, empirical, or legal basis suggesting that compared to its likely benefit, there's a risk of harm to those receiving it. So there can be some concerns with published evidence-based interventions. So also there are two or more, when there are two or more randomized control trials that have been found to work in practice that have not resulted in pro proven outcome improvement when compared to usual care, then that evidence fails to have effect and does not support the efficacy of use in clinical practice. There's no clinical or empirical evidence or theoretical basis indicating that the practice constitutes an acceptable risk of harm to those receiving it compared to those without likely benefit. That's how you look for acceptability in a, if effectiveness is not known. So the practice has a book, manual, and or other available writings that specify the components of the practice protocol and describe how it's administered. It's generally accepted in clinical practice as appropriate for use. Sometimes there's basic requirements for promising practice. These are usually what are called expert opinions. Or if it's a one study that has utilized some form of control, like an untreated treatment group, placebo group, or matched wait list, which establishes the efficacy over a placebo. These are sometimes reported in the literature, even in the peer reviewed literature. But the outcome measures must be reliable and valid and administered consistently and accurately across all studies. If multiple outcome studies have been conducted, the overall weight of evidence supports the efficacy of the practice. You're still looking for that well supported, efficacious practice change. Some basic requirements are RCTs with at least two rigorous studies that have been done and published that have been found to, that the intervention works and improves a system or health outcome. 
So the practice then has shown to be having a sustained effect beyond the treatment period. Also, you're looking for well-supported, effective practice studies. These are when there are multiple sites that have replicated the same intervention across at least two RCTs and reported in the published peer-reviewed literature. And the intervention or practice change has shown a sustained effect. So in summary, Evidence-based practice must be contextualized by the nurse in a particular clinical setting and patient-nurse relationship, in other words, within the context. Evidence-based practice can provide guidelines for the best practice options in particular situations, and you, as a graduate scholar, need to learn how to critically appraise evidence prior to use in a quality improvement project. This concludes this lesson. If you should have any additional questions, please email me. Thank you. Now think about your assignment. Complete the worksheet as assigned, and remember QI is an iterative process and your worksheet may change as you learn new or additional information or find new evidence. So this week, what you're going to focus on is selecting an evidence-based intervention. If you don't know what evidence-based intervention is best for your context, which is your setting and your population, think about the following. Identify the needs. The underlying needs should be identified and articulated as the basis for exploring appropriate practice changes. And establish the desired outcome a clear statement of what is to be achieved by introducing a new practice change. Identify potential evidence-based practices. Consider them. If they address the need and achieve the outcome through the lens of resources and capacity to find the best fit for that setting and population, then critically assess resources and capacity. Context is critical. Whatever practice change is chosen has to be usable and pragmatic in terms of resources and capacity. So choose the best fit practice change for quality improvement. Consider the needs and outcomes and resources and capacity and choose the practice change that best fits those four elements. Please remember to use peer-reviewed published articles as evidence and try to locate something of higher level, which is RCT, systematic review, or meta-analysis. Thank you.